around my soldiers' way. Lead him in all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Number one, two, zero. <laughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending ring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest, I am my Savior, am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. All right, thank you. Mike's on mute. All right. All other ground is sinking sand. That's right. I've never heard that. That's that is. If you build on a rock, you build on a foundation. If you build on the sand, you do what Babylon did. They built on a river or on the sand. That's what it's talking about. All right, I'm going to read to you some of our emails that we get from around the country and around the world, like like uh, John Cameron Swayze used to say. He was the top uh, news announcer in 1956 and 57 when I was in high school. He was the... Um, he was the, who were the big famous guys in the 70s and 80s, the news announcers, Dan Rather, uh, and he, 
he was the he was the Dan Rather before his time, and, but his name was John Cameron Swayze, and he would say from around the country and around the world, this is John Cameron Swayze, brought to you by Timex Watches, which takes a licking and keeps on ticking. You remember that? He's, he's the guy that said that. <laughs> All right. I've got some emails. Rebecca Rogers in Luke, Texas writes to us, she's a dear lady. We send money to her each month. I mailed some money out yesterday to her. I mailed money out to to a lot of people. We give away about $3,000 a month to the needy believers. You have to be a believer. And she is in a wheelchair. And uh, I don't think she can walk well at all. And uh, she lives in Loop, Texas, and way out in West Texas, and barely in the Panhandle, I believe. And uh, she had a caregiver that was her brother. He died of cancer about three weeks ago. And she doesn't know how she's going to get along, so she's kind of just hobbling, doing the best she can. She writes and says, Shalom, Sister Mary. I just wanted to send you and Brother Jim a video of me walking up the ramp to get into my house. It's a very steep ramp, and it's attached to the deck and folds over into the doorway. Hopefully, I can get moved into my tiny house before winter. I sold my brother's truck, and now we get supplies. Right now, it's just 200 square feet, empty shell. I had, that's not much to live in, 200 square feet. I had him to remove the bathtub and build me a shower I can walk into, and we're not putting in cabinets, but shelves instead. I was working hard at physical therapy because I was coming to, wanting to come visit you because you have changed my life so much. I'm so grateful by the way Brother Jim teaches. I really love this aletheia. That's the word truth. This has given me strength to do and deal with things that happen to me. I've tried to call you but always seem to get a busy signal. Thank you for the help you send me. I really appreciate it. I can't make it without you. I love you both. Agape and Fleo, uh, Rebecca Rogers in Loop, Texas. We love you, Rebecca. Keep writing to us. And then James Hassler in East China, Michigan writes to us. Jim, not sure what people mean when they ask me to pray for someone. Well, pray that God will give them strength to go through the trials they're having to go through. I'm not asking God to do anything to change someone's situation, good or bad. That's good. Prayers, I'll put it on the board. It's the word prosukumai. P-R-O-S-E-U-C-H-O-M-A-I. Prosukumai comes from two words, pros, means for or toward and U-K-E-U-C-H-E. And U-K means to will or desire oneself towards the will of another. Prayer means to bow to the will of God. It means to say, Lord, thy will is being done. Give so-and-so strength to get through what you'd have them to go through. That's all you can pray for. Have you ever noticed how many people pray for people to be well and they die? It doesn't. It doesn't work all the time, and you have to pray that God will give them strength to get through what they're going through. Not sure what people mean. I'm not asking God to change someone's situation, good or bad. I can only bow to God's will and praise Him for His will, because all things are done for good to them that love God. That's what Romans. 8 and 28 says it also bothers me when people say God bless you when they finish 
conversing with someone. Well, God bless means well words. Eulageo. That's then the well words is the words of God. What you're saying is make God's word go with you. It sounds like they're giving God an order. No, not really. If you mean it, it depends on how you mean it. May God's word go with you. I would rather them say, may it be God's will to bless you. That's fine. Am I being too critical with my analysis? No, you're being just right. Thank you for your time, Jim. James Hassler in East China, Michigan. All right, I had a lady write to me, and it was a thrilling email because of some of the things she said. She said, Hi, my name is Donna. I left the Catholic Church at 18 and went into a oneness Pentecostal the next 50 years. Boy, that's just as bad. The one that's Pentecostal believe that there's one God and the three persons are in the one God, that Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Son, and Jesus is the Holy Ghost. It's very foolish. I did not have his mark. Word was easy prey for these people. It's always a, It's almost a year ago that the Lord opened my eyes to the truth. It was shocking to see the depths of darkness that I was in. After discovering the truth about 1 Corinthians 14, well, 1 Corinthians 14 talks about tongues, but the word in 1 Corinthians 14 is glossa, means foreign language. And the reason 1 Corinthians 14 is because that was letter written to Corinth, and Corinth is right here, right there in lower Greece, right on the, before you get into that Peloponnesus, that hand there. Looks like a hand. And it's right here. That's where Corinth is. It's right in the center of the Mediterranean Sea. You had all kinds of sailors and salesmen coming through there. And they were speaking, some of them speaking Spanish, some of them speaking uh, French, some of them speaking all kinds of languages. And Paul said, I don't want anybody coming here speaking in a foreign language. That's what he was saying. He said, by twos and threes, stand over to the side and have one interpret that knows your language. It, it's really crazy because the Pentecostals go on TV and you hear them on TV, Shandalamanda Kanda, Shanda Motala Kala Kamika Shaka, just making this stuff up. It's ridiculous. It's really stupid. And then she says, uh, I was shocked at the depth of darkness that I was in, talking about the Pentecostalism. After discovering the truth about 1 Corinthians 14, Brother Jim, I thought that it was some kind of revelation, and I had to call the bishop of her church, who was a tongue speaker, and reveal it to him, too, so he could tell everyone else. <laughs> you're, you're not going to convert a Pentecostal preacher to this. You have an ear to hear. That's why you heard that, Donna. And fix this lie because he was in command. I did call him. If you care to hear about his reaction, you can respond and ask. Once I saw the, I'm, I really want to know what he had to say. He had to be a nutcase because you're not going to change one of those Pentecostal preachers who found, whose foundation is founded on that doctrine. Once I saw the light, I figured I better check out what else I had been tricked into believing in that Pentecostal mood for 50 years. Oh my, only everything. My son also seeing and seeking the truth introduced me to your teachings and I've been addicted in a good way. I watch and take notes. I watch all day and all night till 3 and 4 a.m. <laughs> it's so wonderful to hear truth. 
I'm so sick of the lies and twisted words. I know there are many asleep in Christ, like me and my son, who has been shaken awake and alive again in his truth. Those locusts, that lets you know that she's hearing this. A locust was a false teacher, or a scorpion was a false teacher. The locust stole the literal food, and the scorpions, scorpion is the word scorpios, S-K-O-R-P-I-O-S, and the verb form is scorpizo, S-K-O-R-P-I-Z-O, means to scatter. And Jesus said, the hireling, the man who preaches for money, he allows the wolf to come in and scatter. And wolves are false teachers. He allows the wolves to scatter. Scorpizo, the flock. So scorpions are the same thing as false teachers. They're not demons, like John MacArthur says. These locusts who have been eating my bread could not kill me because I was predestined to survive. You're exactly right. I understand everything you teach, except I have a few questions. Could you explain why Jesus allowed two crazies <laughs> that were living amongst the tombs to go into the whole herd of swine? I've explained this dozens and dozens of times. Jesus transgressed the laws of nature every time you turn around. Right before he drove the, drove the so-called demons, which there wasn't, the man said he'd had demons. Jesus didn't say he had demons. You always got to look at who's talking. When Jesus said, T soyes te no noma, he said, what is this fellowship you're associating with? And the guy said, Legion, I got 3,000 demons in me. Where did he get that idea? From their culture. They said everything was a demon. But demons in the first century comes out of paganism. They said if you were a good person when you were alive, you died, you became a demon. You actually became a demigod or demi, D-E-M-I, G-O-G, which was a which was a smaller god, R-A-D-A-E-M-O-N, daemon, and it's our word demon. They said you became that. I have gone into this in dozens and dozens of tapes. The Right before the man, right before the so-called demons were cast in the swine, the man was said to be he was said to be possessed with devils. That's one word in the Greek. It's the word D-A-I-M-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I. It is a form of the word demon, D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. Well, demonizomai means to be insane, to be insane. And after Jesus cast self out of him, he came, the Bible says, he was out in the streets sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed. Now, he wasn't clothed when he was running through the tombs, cutting himself and screaming. He was nuts. He was, and he, they came and found him clothed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, being instructed, and in his right mind. The word right mind is the word sophroneo, S O P H R O N E O. That means to be sane. He was insane beforehand and now he's sane you say why why cast it what was into him in the 
demons. The man asked Jesus to do that. He said, don't have my demons go away. I want to communicate with them. I want to talk to them. I talk to the dead. That's why he was in the tombs. This is a long story. You need to look it up on the internet. When Jesus would transgress the laws of nature. Right before that, he was in a boat out on the sea, and his winds were blowing, the storm was coming up, and the apostle said, Lord, carest thou not that we perish? And Jesus sat up and went, shh. That's all he did, and the storm stopped. He transgressed the laws of nature all the time. He said, you want in these pigs what's going on in you, which is self? Watch what happens when I put into them what's in you. It was the desire for self. An animal will not live. It'll kill itself before. And the amazing thing, they rush down into the sea. Every time you see Babylon being destroyed, it's being destroyed in the sea. In Jeremiah, the 51st chapter, Jeremiah took the book of the law and he gave it to a young man and said, put this, put this cord around it and put a stone on it. Go to Babylon and tell the people, so shall Babylon sink. And when you look at, when you look at the 18th chapter of Revelation, it shows Babylon sinking into the sea. That's the same thing that the, these people did. I've got more to say on that, but I don't have time to get into all of it. I do need help understanding Pentecostalism. Around 42 minutes in the video, I got the understanding that Peter spoke to the devout Jews and men of Judea in his own language. That's right. He spoke in his dialect of the Koine. And all of them heard him in their respective languages. That's true. These were Jews from every nation under heaven. And they all spoke a different dialect of the common Greek language. All of them. That's why they couldn't understand each other when they first started coming back. Around 200 B.C., they would get together and they couldn't even understand one another. The compendia tells us that what they did, they started building synagogues in Babylon. They built a Mesopotamian synagogue, which was on the Euphrates River. They built a synagogue, an Ephesian synagogue, a Greek synagogue from different portions of that land, a Roman synagogue. That way these people, when they come back to these three festivals, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Ingathering, they could go to their respective synagogues and have fellowship. Before that, they didn't even know how to talk to each other. You get that out of the compendia. It's about the Jews. It's I can't explain all this. It takes me an hour and a half to get started on it. You need to look at all the DVDs I've got about tongues on the Internet. Wouldn't that be called the gift of hearing? That's right. They said, how hear we ever, man, in our own dialectos, dialect. They had a different dialect of the common street language in every city-state. Since Peter was not speaking from his mouth, their languages, that's right. It was a miracle of the ear. How hear we every man in our own dialect wherein we were born? If that was the case, then why would anyone have to be careful to speak plainly or to be easily understood and need an interpreter? You mentioned partition. When the, when the Bible says that they all spoke with other tongues, let me give you that. The petitioning of the tongues. It says in Acts, the second chapter, let me read it to you so you'll... The word is diamorizo. And uh, there appeared unto them cloven tongues, diamorizo. Cloven does not mean that thing that the Pentecostals come up with like that. <laughs> Doesn't mean the split tongue. 
cloven tongues is the word dia, D-I-A, M-E-R-I-Z-O. Dia merizo means a, it means a splitting of tongues. You had the, uh, you had the Grecian tongue being spoken here. You had a Mesopotamian here. You had the Ephesians here. And they would hear in their own language when they were born. That's the word cloven. It means dim rizzo. <laughs> it means petitioned off tongues. Now, let me finish reading this. I can't explain all this all at once. It's a thousand points to it. Wouldn't that petition account for the others that were in the upper root speaking in all the various uh, languages while Peter explaining what was going on? Unknown tongues and stammering lips. And the stammering lips comes out of Isaiah, the Isaiah, the uh, 28th chapter. That's when the Syrians were come in. And the Bible says they spoke with stammering lips. Stammering meant what it was talking about. The Assyrians had a dialect of the Hebrew, and they come in and it sounded like a stuttering sound. I've got more to say on that. I can't get into all that right now. It would take me an hour or more. And then it he goes. She goes on to say, Moses stammered speaking Hebrew because he was raised by Egyptians. Moses was a man of a thick tongue. He said, I stutter. And he said, I can't tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And God said, Aaron will be your prophet and speak for you. He didn't say, by the Lord God, let my people go, like Charlton Elvis Heston said. By the Lord God. He couldn't talk that plain. Hebrew, because he's nursed till he was weaned by his mother. Moses was very educated. You want to read something about Moses' life. Read Josephus. Read Moses and Josephus, how he became a great warrior in the army of the Egyptians. How he went out and conquered people and how they... The one of the women of the African nation saw him and thought he was a wonderful guy and she wanted to marry him and she did marry him. And that was probably why he was given a fit for marrying an Ethiopian woman whom I'm sure taught him. I stammer in Spanish when I'm in Mexico. My point, the prophet Joel didn't say the people would hear in the last days. He said they would speak to the people. Anyway, that's my understanding. I've got dozens of messages on tongues. I clarify all of it. Just watch for them on the Internet. Anyway, that's my understanding. Please help me. I'm desperate. I've been so deceived for so long. I'm scared to fall into that trap again. This is not a trap. This is the truth. Anxiously, anxiously awaiting, and your student, Donna, no address given. Donna, we love you. That's a tremendous email. Thank you so much. Then I've got some YouTube comments. One guy here hates me, and he doesn't even say what it is he hates about me. <laughs> Let me see here. Let me erase this. He doesn't like me at all. He thinks I'm a some kind of a pagan. All right, he says, this comes from Defend Truth. He sounds like a kid, like a young boy. It's on contention and strife you will learn by hanging around people who marry truth with a lie. You, Jim Brown, are not needed. Uh, why? You beguile, and it is you who cunning and in craft try to deceive the body of Christ. Over what? 
You mean over Christmas, Christ Mass? You mean you don't like what I teach on Christ Mass? Christ Mass is Roman Catholicism. It's the Mass of Roman Catholicism. You don't like that? Then you don't like history. You are indeed Antichrist. <laughs> this guy's funny, isn't he? And you twist in order to lift yourself up on your throne. You're very funny, whoever you are. Is it predestination you don't like? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. To be conformed, sumorphos, S-U-M-M-O-R-P-H-O-S, to the image, E-I-K-O-N, to the likeness of Christ. Is that what you don't like? Predestinate, prohorizo, to predetermine for the light or for the horizon. Is that what you don't like? You don't like it because I teach God creates evil. Is that it? Isaiah 45 and 7, I make peace and I create evil. I don't know do all these things. I wrote this paper here. Does God create evil? Maybe you don't like that. He says... All through this paper, I've got hundreds of places where God says, I create evil. He says, uh, I'll call you to eat your sons and daughters in Jeremiah 19 and 9. And then 2 Kings 6 and 33, behold, this evil is from the Lord. Maybe that's what you don't like, right? Maybe you don't like the Bible. And 2 Kings 21, 12 Thus saith the Lord, I am bringing such evil on Jerusalem. Whosoever heareth it, both of the ears shall tingle. I will wipe Jerusalem clean as a man wipes a slate. Is that what you don't like? And then in Second Kings 22, uh, 16 and 20, Thus saith the Lord, I will bring evil upon this place. You don't like that? Uh, I got a hundred places here. And God put a lying spirit into these prophets of Ahab. You don't like that? Did They said in Nehemiah 13, Nehemiah said, Did not your fathers thus, and did not, not God bring all this evil upon us? You don't like that? You're, you're just an ignorant man. He goes on to say, You're built on the... You are not built on the foundation of the apostles or prophets. What is it you don't like that I'm teaching? You don't even know what the word foundation is, do you, in the Greek? You are of the synagogue of Satan, and your judgment was prepared for you before the foundation of the holy world in which you, are not, which you cannot corrupt. And you didn't give me one thing that you didn't like that I said. You're just an ignoramus is what you are. All I'm doing is giving definition. All right. Aiden White writes to us and commented on the days of Noah, the end of time, things that will happen. Pastor Brown, I have two questions. What does fast mean? There's one true fast. You'll find that in the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah 58. The true fast is not giving up food. It's giving up self for others, to help others. And he says here in this 58th chapter, Behold, you fast for strife and debate to prove how much food you give up and smite with the fist of wickedness. And such a fast that I have chosen a day for man to afflict his soul. Afflict the soul was the word anal. It means to give up self. That's the word that you find in Leviticus, the 16th chapter, on the Day of Atonement. They would afflict the soul. Anal. And then he says, it's not, 
It's not just the fact that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness and give up your wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and my burden is light, Jesus said, and to let the oppressed go free. This is the true fast, that you break every yoke. The yoke of a kingdom was the laws of kingdom. Is not this the, to, to deal thy bread to the hungry and give to the needy? And that there bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him. And that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. He says, when you do this, then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Thine health shall be spread forth speedily. Thy righteousness shall go before thee to the glory of the Lord shall be thy re reward. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here is here I am, if thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking vanity. Give up self is what he's talking about. All through this chapter, that's the true fast. When you learn to give up self. And then he says, when you fast, are you not supposed to eat? Read the 58th chapter of Isaiah. I'm not going to say that fasting doesn't help the body. It doesn't help you spiritually, it helps the body. Peter the Rock writes to us and says, he's talking about sons of God married the daughters of men, explained, angels do not sleep with women. I have studied this topic for eight years. I've studied it for 35 or 40. And they most certainly were men, not angels. You have to do some serious exegesis to come up with the fallen angels theory. You have to do, twist the Bible all to pieces because angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. The fact that it says that they were beautiful, fair, says it all as it is telling you why they had sex because of their sexual desires whoever said angels have sexual desires whoever came up with that whoever said god gave angels genitalia so they could have sexual relationships whoever came up with that that's something men had to invent i said it last time you go out here in the woods and cattle will copulate with cattle, not with deer. They even know what their species is. If it were fallen angels trying to destroy God's creation, it wouldn't have mattered what they looked like. That's right. And they would have also had sex with Noah and his clan too. All verses in Job and New Testament are men, not angels. Well, the angels are locked in Tartarus there in Second Peter, the second chapter. They're already kept till the day of destruction. But most can't explain the real meaning. Job 38, verse 7, is answered by Luke 4, verses 38, and Psalms 48, 148, verse 3. The sons of God are the sun and the moon. No, the sons of God are the believers. You messed up on the end of it. The sons of God are those who are led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit is the truth. That's in Romans 8 and 14. It's not the sun and the moon. John Hall commented on mixed marriage, sons of God, married daughters of men. Hey, Brother Jim, what is your stance on eschatology? Eschatos is the word end times. And eschatology comes from eschatos and logos, which is the word, word. It means the study of the end times. I've done hundreds of messages on that. Go on the internet and look them up. Do you take pre-mill, a-mill, or post-mill stance? I believe we are in the millennium right now. Except it's not millennium. It is the word Kilia. C H I L I. It's plural. 
It's not thousand. In the first century, there was no zeros. Anytime you add zero to something, to the best scholars like E.W. Bullinger, it's a form of the original number. Ten or a hundred or a thousand is a form of one. One thousand is not an adjective. Telling how many. An adjective. One thousand is a noun, just like dozen. 999 is an adjective as hells how many is an adjective. But 1,000 is a noun, and it being plural, it has to tell you how many thousands it is. Being plural, it's two kilia or more. And it, the Bible teaches that, that there's a 2,000-year period where the Gentiles, actually it says nations, this is why Satan is bound to Dio. He's forbidden from, de from deceiving the nations, and the word is ethnos, and it also is the same exact word for Gentiles. There's only one period of where there's a 2,000-year period where the Gentiles cannot be deceived, and that's from Acts 2 till the end of time. We have to be close to that now. We have to be close to the end. The world is so corrupt. It's corrupt to the core. All right. You ought to know, I don't believe in a pre-trib rapture at all. We're going to be changed at the last trump. And the Baptists will say, well, that's the last trump the saints will hear. That's not what it says. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We'll all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last eschatos trump. Eschatos means the last in a series after which no other trumpet will sound. There are seven trumpets in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. In 10 and 7, when the seventh or the last trumpet sounds, Christ has got one foot on the land and the other on the sea. His time is no more. It's over. It's over at the last trump. There's no seven-year tribulation after the last trump, and there's no thousand-year reign. And that's, the man that brought that to America was a man named J.N. Darby. He's the one that brought premillennialism and he brought the pre rapture to America around 1836. He corrupted the word of God. Well, that'll be all that I've got to read. And if you want more on this, I've got them all over the Internet. Just look for Last Trump, look for Millennium. There's no such thing. That millennium means thousand years, mill annum. That's not the word. The word is kilia. There's two kilia. I don't believe, boy, this, that confused me. When my father would preach that and all those independent Baptists I'd get around would preach that, and I thought, this is crazy. If the world's over at the signing of the seventh trumpet, where do they come up with this? All right, let me, I'll raise forward my title. All right. We, we help a lot of people that are believers that are struggling with um, with their lives, with their health. But you have to be a 100% believer in order for us to help you. And you've got to convince me of that over a period of time that you're watching and you're hearing. We've got ladies all over the world some of them are struggling with every kind of problem you can think of and uh, 
Well, let me get my pen. I dropped it. Some of them really struggling with health. This lady over in Australia, Julie, she's got terminal cancer, and she keeps going in and out of remission. And I just, we feel bad for her. We send her 300 American dollars every month. And we send $300 to this lady in, in uh, Amarillo, Texas. And she's got leukemia. And her cancer bill, her leukemia bill runs 15000 a month. Her insurance pays for that. But she only draws about 1000 a month. And after she pays 500 a month rent, and pays a couple hundred a month for for her utilities and a few other things. She has no money left, so we send her some money every month. We send the lady down in South Louisiana. I talked to her yesterday. I said, let us know as soon as you get through this government program because she's got to go through a government program. She was... She became a paraplegic about 16 years ago. She's driving to her mother's house, and she fell asleep and ran into a telephone pole and became a paraplegic. She needs our help. And uh, as soon as she goes through this program, this uh, program for uh, uh, for paraplegic people, to get this wheelchair accessible van, we got the money to buy her a van. I made the plea throughout the world on the internet, and we're going to buy her this van. We've got the money in the bank right over here across the street. And then we got people like Amanda Meadows out here in Murfreesboro. She had to get custody of her grandchildren because her daughter wouldn't get off drugs. And so we sent her $300 a month. I'm not saying this to brag. It's our duty and our obligation. If you want to support these needy people, send your send your your offering in the care in form of a check. Make the check to Grace and Truth, and put on the bottom so much money for needy and so much for the offering or for your tithe, and we'll be sure you get all these things. I've, uh, we've got so many things happening in this ministry. We want to build a building. It will have to be a small building. We want to build a small building. You can't have a big church preaching what I preach. You cannot have a mega church. When you preach Christmas is pagan, Easter is paganism, predestination is true, God does not love everybody. The Bible says so. It says he loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born. And people overall don't like the truth. It bothers them. And what we're trying to do is to tell people the truth. Just uh, pray for the ministry and we'll do everything we can to get the word out. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Above everything, it's liberating. It makes us free. And God, we pray that you'll, you'll help us to stand in these truths till you come. And we'll praise you for everything, fight our battles. In Christ's name we pray, amen. This guy is that wrote me and hated me and says I'm going to hell. <laughs> I don't think so. I trust Jesus. I believe everything he said in the Greek text. Don't you? Evidently you don't.
I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I've got a title on the board, and it says, Preachers are lying. They're lying across America. They're not telling the truth about the Bible. The reason people say, why are they lying? Because Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3 that the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, of the Lord. And that's a reference back to the previous chapter to verse 8. That Jesus is coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those that know not God and that obey not the gospel. That's how he's coming back. And this day will not come except the come of falling away first. We're in the falling away. This is not even the same world that I was raised in in the 40s. I was born in 39, 1939. I was raised as a little kid in the 40s. In the 50s, I was a teenager. This is not the same world I was in. The 50s was like Fonzie and Happy Days. That's what it was like. It was simple. The guys didn't, uh, we didn't even know of anything about drugs down in Beaumont, Texas at Beaumont High School. Never even heard of them before. And falling away is the word apostasis, apostasis. It's our word apostasy. Apostasy comes from two words, apo, meaning removal, and stasis. Stasis is the word to stand and be upright. Upright. And Stasis comes from the word staros, T-A-U-R-O-S. And that is the word cross. There has been a removal of the daily cross in the pulpits of America. The preachers don't care what a daily cross is. People are comfortable listening to their preacher. I was listening to a Baptist preacher before I come to church this morning, and he was a big Baptist church down in Nashville. He was boring me out of my mind. God wants you to have a good life, and he loves you, and he wants everything to go good for you. No, he does not. It's just much a foolish double talk. Well... This is proof that Jesus is coming back soon. We're in a we're in a, in such an apostate condition. People don't even care about the truth, the divine truth of the Bible. I've written myself some notes here. And the world, the preachers don't care that they have no compassion on their congregation if they had compassion the point is let me tell you how the congregation is I know how it is the congregation is confused because they don't really know whether they're believers or not it, wouldn't you say that's true about most people I don't know whether I'm a believer I don't know whether I'm saved or not that's because they think they have to know because some preacher said you have to know that's not true you have to believe and your faith has to be in Christ not in your own personal knowing I keep using this verse I keep using this over here in in uh, Second Timothy, the first chapter, when Paul is talking, he's saying, I'm an apostle, a preacher, and a teacher, and I'm suffering for these things. The Pharisees are chasing me all over the country, trying to kill me. I used to be an enemy to the Christians. 
I was going about the world trying to kill all the Christians I could. I was a Pharisee, and I was more zealous of these traditions of my father's. And he said, I was trying to kill the Christians all of my good. And I've watched myself become one of them. And now the world is trying to kill me like I was killing Christians. Where do you find that, Jim? Well, that's over here in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, when Paul says, in Acts the ninth chapter, he says, in Acts 9, he says, when God, right before God struck me down on the Damascus road, Saul, verse 1, chapter 9, Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Slaughter is the word phonos, P-H-O-N-O-S. It, the word definition is Murder. Paul said, I was murdering Christians in the name of the Pharisees. I was taking them and hailing them. And that's what he says in the 8th chapter when he says in verse 3, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. He, made, he was insulting and mal maltreating the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women. To hail means to drag them out by the hair of their head or by their necks, whatever they had to do. He says the same thing over here in Acts 26. In Acts 26, he says, this is what I was doing. Acts 26 and verse 10. 26 and 10. Twenty six and ten, he says, and when which thing also I, I did in Jerusalem, many of the saints did I shut up in prison, and having received authority from the chief priest, when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them when they were killed. Paul said, I was killing these people. That was what I did. And look in Acts 22, 4 and 19. Acts 22. Paul was a killer of Christian. 22, 4. 22, 4. I persecuted this way. This way is the word hodos. And the narrow way is the way we go. And he said, I persecuted this way and unto death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. Then he says in verse 19, I said, Lord, they know I am imprisoned and, and beat in every synagogue them that believed on you. So this is why Paul said what he said in 2 Thessalonians. Look at 2 Thessalonians. And they were chasing Paul all over the country because he became a Christian and he started believing what the Bible said about Christians. When you look at 2 Timothy, the first chapter, 2 Timothy, the first chapter, He says in verse 10, 2 Timothy, first chapter, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul is talking about Jesus as his Savior. He was killing people that said that before he came to the knowledge of truth. Who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. It is not the Gentiles that's chasing him. 
It is the Pharisees, the Jewish ruling class. And then he says, for which cause? What is the cause he's talking about? Being an apostle, a preacher, and a teacher. For which cause? I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed of God's gospel. For I know whom I have believed. You have to understand what he said when he said no. He didn't use our word no. Our word no is gnosko. G-I-N-O-S-K-O. Gnosko means to learn. He said, I've learned who I believe in, but that's not what he said. He said, I ido. I see and perceive. There's two words for no, gnosko and ido. Ido is like being an eyewitness. Paul said, I'm an eyewitness to the change in my life, what God did to me. And now I can see. I used to be a killer of Christians. Now I'm one of them. And they're trying to kill me for doing what I used to kill people for. Paul, you know, that's why he never failed after he started preaching. Now, Peter was just an old fisherman. He kept falling down and getting his foot in his mouth. And he'd tell Jesus, oh, no, 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 you don't need to be crucified and resurrected from the dead. That's why Jesus said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Satan, Satanas, S-A-T-A-N-A-S, means an adversary. Peter was being an adversary to Christ when he said, no, no, Jesus had have to go to Jerusalem, be crucified and resurrected the third day. And Peter said, be it far from thee, that's not going to happen. And Jesus said, you're my adversary, Peter, I have to do this. Now, the preachers just don't care about the truth. I watched these three preachers on TV this morning. I was bored out of my mind. Just wasn't saying nothing that had to do with anything. The Bible says so much about we have to take our cross and die daily. But preachers don't even tell people about a cross. They come up and think that a daily cross has to do with being behind on their house note, and it doesn't. They think that a daily cross has to do with uh, fighting their in-laws. Well, to a degree, that's the way it is. But it only has to do with fighting your in-laws over the truth. In the first century, you had to be condemned to a cross. That was one of the worst ways a man could die. Condemned to a cross. You either had to be a criminal or a slave. You could not go to a cross if you were a Roman citizen. They, that was against their law. Jesus was crucified as a criminal for saying he was God in the eyes of the Pharisees. When he said, before Abraham was, I am, they took up stones to stone him because the I am God was the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. I've been talking to you. What the preachers have done in the world today, they have married truth with a lie. I keep saying that. I've got this on the board. Preachers are lying. They're lying about a daily cross. You say, what do you mean lying about a daily cross? Well, they're not telling people they have to have one. Now, Jesus himself said in Luke 14... Twenty-three. He said, He that beareth not his cross and followeth after me cannot be my disciple. You cannot be a disciple of Christ 
The word disciple is the word mathetes. Mathetes, we get our word mathematics from that, or math. It means a learner. Now, if you go into a math class, and if you go into an algebra class, let's say, and you don't learn the axioms and the postulates and the other mathematical laws, you can't pass the class. You cannot obey God. And the Bible speaks of being obedient to the faith, doing the truth. And the preachers don't tell people what definitions are. Truth is one of my favorite definitions, aletheia, A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. It comes from the word lanthano. And the alpha privative, which negates that word lanthano, gives an opposite meaning. The alpha privative is the first letter of the Greek alphabet used as a negative particle, that letter there. But it'll tell you that in your Strong's Concordance, from a neg part is what it'll say. So it means it's the opposite of landano, which means to lie hid or conceal. It means not to lie anything hid or not to conceal anything. That's what truth, doing truth is. You have to obey righteousness. Yet he that doeth truth, he that doeth righteousness is righteous. We have to be obedient to the faith. That's what the Bible says over and over and over again. You have to obey the word of God, but if you don't tell them what it means, how are they going to be obedient to it? I've got some notes here. Preachers have no shame that they refuse to tell their congregations the truth. They have no compassion for the ignorance of their people. Like the lady that wrote us, and she said, until I saw you, I was just covered up with all the error of the Pentecostal movement. She said, and I, I'm so thankful that I heard these truths. People don't even, they don't explain anything to anybody. They don't tell people, preachers don't tell people that you have to take a cross and die daily. It doesn't just say take a cross. It says take one and die daily. If you die daily, that leads you to resurrection. Resurrection, every time you find it, except one time, is the word anastasis. Anastasis is feminine gender. That's not talking about the resurrection of Christ. When Jesus said, I am the resurrection, he said that when he was calling Lazarus out of the grave. Lazarus out of the grave and Mary his sister said I know he'll be resurrected in the in the resurrection at the last day and Jesus said I am the resurrection and that word resurrection Anastasis he was saying I can raise Lazarus from the dead today that is a picture of predestination Preachers will not even talk about predestination. I misspelled it. Predestination. Predestination is a fact, and preachers won't even deal with it. The Bible says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. I've said this a thousand times. The whole purpose of predestination is that no one will come to Christ on their own. There's none righteous, not one. There's none that understandeth, and there is none that seeketh after God. If nobody seeks God, no one. There in Romans 10 uh, and 12 and 13. If nobody seeks God, 
If God doesn't pick himself out of people and put faith in their hearts, nobody's coming. And preachers won't tell them anything about this. You cannot come to Christ on your own. Why? You're dead. How dead is dead? Well, it's dead. It's as dead as you can be. And you have to quicken Ephesians 1, uh, Ephesians 2 and 2. You had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. You were dead. If you're going to be quickened, I misspelled that there. E N E D. Quickened Z O O P O I E O. Zumpoel is the word quickened, comes from zoo. And poeo, P-O-I-E-O. It means to make alive. You go to the zoo to see living animals, and it means to make you alive when you were dead. That means when you were dead, you didn't have any will to come to God on your own. How does this happen? This is the miracle of the new birth. It's, it's God's miracle what he does, he has chosen a family before the foundation of the world. He chose us, but he didn't just choose us to go to heaven. He chose us to be holy and without blame before him in love. But we weren't holy while we were dead. We weren't without blame. We were in our sin when we were dead. Sin is what killed us. Paul said, I was alive outside the law once. But sin took occasion by the commandment and killed me. It slew me. That in Romans 7. So we've been chosen, Ephesians 1 and 4. We've been, he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Not just to be in heaven, but to be holy and without blame as believers. And he has to see to it that he puts faith in our hearts so we can believe him. Holy is the word hagios. Without blame is amamos, A-M-O-M-O-S. Mamos means to be blamed. The alpha negates that word, means no blame. What part of us is not to be blamed? The inner man. Paul said we've got an inner man. That is the new birth, and we've got an outer man. Outer man that serves the law of the flesh. And, and this inner man... He is holy. Holy is the word hagios, and it means to be pure. How is it pure? Well, God puts us through fire, fire, trials, persecution. Daily cross, daily cross and all the rest of these trials. And over the years, this inner man cannot sin. The Bible says that. The Bible says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Well, the only thing that's born of God is this inner man, according to Romans 7, 25. There's a, we have an outer man that can't stop sinning. We have an inner man that can't sin. Whoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin. It's impossible for that man to sin. But he works on this outer man who can't quit sinning. Let me say something about the outer man I haven't said quite clear. If we say we have no sin, 1 Corinthians 1 and 8, if we say we have no sin, let me add something to that, that we say we don't need to repent of. If you say you don't have any sin, you don't need to repent of. 
Can you think of it? Can you think of one? Can you think of a sin in your life you need to repent of? If you say you have no sin, if you say you have it, then you've got to admit you have it, and then you've got to repent of it. The Bible says in Luke 13 and 3, Luke 13 and 3, if, that if, if we don't repent, we will all likewise perish. That word repent is present tense subjunctive mood. A present tense and subjunctive mood is something that is over and over and over again. Why would that be? Because every day we get up out of bed, when you're young especially, you have a tendency to turn around to self. And you've got to have that conviction in your heart, I've got to stop living for me. And you have to constantly turn from self. These preachers, they're preaching, they're preaching a know-nothing gospel. It is not the gospel. I hear preachers talking about the gospel all the time. One day I decided just to go through my concordance and go down the line and see what the gospel was. And I take my concordance and I stopped on Mark the first chapter. Mark 1. You preachers don't preach this. Mark the first chapter says the beginning of the gospel. Beginning of the gospel is it was written in the prophets and that is a reference particularly to to Isaiah 40 and 3 and Malachi the third chapter verse 1 and 2 the beginning of the gospel as it was written in the prophets is you can say beginning is Prepare ye the way. I have never heard any preacher talk about what prepare you the way of the Lord means. There's only one way that we walk. That is the word hodos. Hodos. There is a narrow way. That is the way of the Lord. A narrow way and a broad way. I've never heard any preacher explain what the narrow way is. All they do is mush around it. They say the narrow way is being a good Christian, coming to the Baptist church and walking down the aisle and accept Christ. And that's not the narrow way at all. Not at all. Narrow is the word T-H-L-I-B-O. That's the word narrow. Thalibo is a verb. doesn't look like it. it means to be pressured from all sides by people who don't like your message. It means to be persecuted. It comes from the verb form, thalipsis, T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S. And that is the noun form. Thalipsis is the common Greek word, tribulation. I don't hear any preacher telling their congregation, you have to go through tribulation, Acts 14, 22. When Paul was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra, Tribulation doesn't mean late on your car payment. It does not mean late on your house note. It does not mean having a hard time from your neighbor next door because you mowed into his yard. It doesn't mean that. When Paul said those words, he had been stoned by the Pharisees and left for dead. I looked up stoning in 
the McClinican Strong, take your S volume, look up stoning. They would take a man and put him on the top of a precipice that was either twice his height or a little higher than that. And they would take him up there and have him stand backward and they'd push him off backward off of that. that that's like these are eight foot ceilings. Just stop and think. If you're another six foot higher than this and push a man off, if it broke his neck or killed him, they would say he was been stoned. If he didn't die, they would have his accuser come up, take a big boulder and crush his chest with it. And then if that didn't kill him, they would pick up these big rocks, big rocks, and stone him till he died. They thought that Paul was dead when they stoned him outside of Lystra. Lystra was just a little town here in the middle of what we call Turkey. It was a town in the state of Galatia, right about where my finger is pointing. These Pharisees had come from Antioch and come over to Iconium and they ran they got those people to run him out of town and he come down here about 20 miles to Lystra and they said and the the funny thing is the pagans received him because he healed a man there and said he must be a god well these same Baptist preachers Pentecostal preachers came over here and came down to Lystra and talked him into take him out the city outside the city and killing him, except they didn't kill him. He was banged up all to pieces. He must have had bones of all kinds broken. He was he, he got up on his feet and he went on down to the next town, in Derby. He preached at Derby, came back to Lystra, came back to Iconium, came back to to Antioch, and then he went home all beat up. He, I mean, he looked like he'd been in an elephant wreck. Somebody, somebody had run over him with an elephant. He looked like he was all to pieces. But you don't hear people saying. You don't hear preachers telling people they have to go through tribulation. I heard one idiot of a preacher say in this town one time, we live in a Christian nation. It's not possible to be uh, go through tribulation in America. You're an idiot, mister. If you tell people Christmas is pagan, they won't do that. What is it they're doing? They're talking smooth talk. You know what they're doing? They're flattering their people. These preachers are using flattery. They make them feel good. That's what the preachers are about today. If you don't believe that, watch one of them, then you'll get bored to death with them. I'm bored with them. Do you ever try to watch them? I try to watch them. I'll go, I can't, can't stand this. It's been five minutes since I turned it on. I can't stand this guy. Turn him off. I do that. I'll try to watch him for more than five minutes. I can't. It's like God wants you and he loves you and he likes you and he wants you to have all the things of life and he's trying to give you complete, give you everything you want and everything you desire and he loves you to that point and he just wants you to have a good life. And What do you think of that? <laughs> that's what I think about it. Because that's not what he wants for our life. We must through much tribulation. That's where he made that statement, Acts 14, 22, after he, they tried to kill him. It's not being behind on a note of some kind. What they're doing, let me read some verses to you about flattery. There's several verses, words about flattery in the Bible. There's this word, most of them come from the word kesem, Q-E-C-E-M. It means to speak smooth words. Let me read some of those to you. This is what the preachers are doing. Over here in Job, the 17th chapter, 
verse 5. He that speaketh flattery, Kesem, to if he that speaketh flattery, or Kalak, excuse me, C H A L I Q, it means to be smooth talking. He that speaketh flattery to his friends. If you tell your friend he's a great guy and everything's good and everything's wonderful, you're wanting to get something from him. Even the eyes of his children shall fail. You know who knows you better than anybody else knows you and your family? Your kids and your spouse. They know you. If you're not honest with your friends, They'll say, my dad is lying. My mom is not telling the truth. Because they know you. Watch out, you don't. There's another word, kana. K-A-N-A-H. This is what these preachers like, kana. They love this word. Look over here in Job 32, verse 21. Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person. Neither let me give flattering titles unto a man. Flattering titles is an additional word like Jim Brown. Ph.D. D.D. L.L.D. Like those titles behind your name? Dr. Brown? Please don't ever call me that. All that is is a flattering title because he turns around, Kana, and says, it means to eulogize. A U L O G I Z E. Eulogize. It means to say, well, logos, words. All you do is you say, I'm not talking about the gossip. Don't gossip. But don't just tell your friend, well, words when you see that he's not living right and he's doing wrong and you put your approval on his life and say, I understand you drink a little and I understand you cuss a little and you don't ever call him down for it. You know what you're doing when you do that? If you don't call down your friend when he's doing wrong, you're performing a false hood. <laughs> A falsehood means a hood you put over something that's false. It's, it's actually worse than a lie. You're covering up what you should be telling them. Whew. And I don't, I'm not saying that everybody that's young needs to be doing that. Because that's hard to do. Isn't it? It's hard to tell your friends the truth. Let me tell you what it does. Telling people the truth. When I was young and I, I wanted to witness somebody and I'd start talking to them. I was 22, 23. My heart would go boom, 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 boom. <laughs> my heart would beat fast. I'm going, huh, huh, huh. And I couldn't relax. But the more Bible words I learned, the more verses I learned, the more I could paraphrase, most of those people don't know what I'm going to say and don't know how to define the words. I got a thousand words in my head. I can just shoot that stuff out real fast. And there's certain ones I like better than others. So if you hide something from somebody, you should be telling them you're lying to them. You're covering something up. I'm not saying you can do this when you're young, but you've got to memorize a lot of verses. If you can't memorize them, paraphrase them. Tell people you've got to go through tribulation to be a believer. 
And then, so you cannot hide something from somebody and expect them to understand that. Now look here in, I'm just giving you some of the, this is what the preachers are doing. They're smoothing people. They're talking smooth words. Look here in Psalms 5 in verse 9. For there is no faithfulness. Well, look at verse 8. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way. The word way is the word direct. Let me erase some of this. The word way is direct. That's the narrow way. When it was translated into Greek, word direct was translated hodos. Direct, every time you find direct, we get our word direction from that. It translated hodos, and that's the narrow way. Every time you find direct in the Old Testament, you find the word way. Nearly every time, it's this word hodos, and that's the narrow way. Narrow. And he says here, Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. Let me know the narrow way. For there is no faithfulness in the mouth of these false teachers. Their inward part is very wickedness. You see, I don't believe a preacher that knows the truth and won't tell it. I don't believe he's a Christian. Don't believe that. I don't care who he is. Preachers, do you believe most of these preachers are believers? No, I don't believe that. If they're believers, they know there's a truth and they know they've got to learn it. I don't believe most of the preachers in America are going to heaven. I believe most of them are going to hell when they die. I believe hell is going to be full of preachers. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Kassam. Or kalak, excuse me. Smooth. They Kalak means to a portion or to distribute. That's the meaning of the word devil, daemonion, means to distribute fortunes. C-H-E-L-E-Q. Kalak. Let me give you another. I'll give you some more of these. Look at this word flatter. It's Look here in, in Psalms 11. This sounds like these preachers in America. Help, Lord. Psalms 11, verse 1. Psalms 12, and verse 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. He ceases in America. What he's saying, he ceased in Israel because they were going after Baal in the grove. You try to tell these preachers that Christmas is the same system that Constantine brought in the church called the Feast of Saturn. Called the Feast of Saturn and renamed it Christ's Mass. I've said this so many times. I wonder if you get it. Revelation 17 and 5. <clears throat> Babylon was the mother of all harlots. Harlot is the word pornea. Means idolatry. means idolatry. Idolatry is the word E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A. -E -E idolatry comes from ido, meaning to see. Remember, ido was a part of that thing where Paul said, I know him, I have believed, I see who I believe. And la truo, L-A-T-R-E-U-O, 
means to serve what you see. Well, if Babylon mothered all idolatry, what Constantine brought in the church, Constantine was the emperor of the Roman Empire. He was having problems with all of these hordes of barbarians coming across what we call the European continent, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Huns, the Vandals, the Burgundians. They, they were all very barbaric people. And he was afraid he was going to lose the empire because he had two problems. He, couldn't, he was trying to slaughter all the Christians. And the Christians were multiplying such a great rate. He said, I'll bring these gods into the corrupt church at Rome and we'll rename the feast of Saturn Christ Mass. And now we'll, that way we can tell all the Christians around the world, you can come in and be a part of the church and these people can bring their tree gods and their sun gods into the church and we can all get along. That's what flattery does. Flattery makes everybody want to get along. Everybody just be quiet. Don't nobody stir up anything. See, when you ask the world, do you believe you're a good Christian? They go to church somewhere. They'll say, yes, I believe I'm a Christian. And they're not if they don't, if they don't take their cross and die daily. Without a daily cross, you cannot go to heaven when you die. You have to have a daily cross, but you have to be condemned to one, and you'll be condemned for telling people Christmas was originally paganism, and that was what Constantine brought in the church and renamed the Feast of Saturn Christ's Mass. They did that when they had that Nicene Council in 325 A.D. He was having, he thought, I'm going to lose the empire. It was all about Power and money is all it was about. He actually organized his own army and started his own army. And he would attack people that did not, they were not believers in Catholicism. They had what they called the Inquisition. The Inquisition had, it lasted 700 years. Inquisition. Inquisition comes from the word inquisitor, which means to question. They would send people into, they would send them into villages. The, the Roman Catholic Church started the Inquisition. Roman Catholics started the Inquisition. They would hear that certain Christians were meeting over here and believing predestination, and they were against the Catholicism, and they would send, they would send soldiers out led by a bunch of thugs and punks, and they would go in and torture people in some village and say, if you don't confess the Mass and you don't protect the Mass, we're going to torture you and then you're going to die. They killed 50 to 75 million believers because they would not partake of the sacrament of the Mass. You can get all that in a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. Just one place you can get it. Let me read some more about this. Let me read this in Psalms 12. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. For the faithful fail from among the children of men. That's what's going on today. When David wrote this, Israel had turned against God and was serving Bell in the Grove. Bell in the Grove of the Old Testament is the same thing as Christmas in the New in the New Testament. It's the same thing as Christmas. It was the fire and tree worship. That's what people can't get through their heads. Bell in the Grove. Israel served Bell in the Grove under another. They served Christmas under an ancient name. Bell in the Grove worship. Bell was the fire god. The grove was the tree god. It's the Christmas tree. You want to read about the Christmas tree? Look at Jeremiah 10, 1 through 4. It describes it to the T. They speak vanity. 
These people that have fallen away from God, they speak hebel, worthlessness. That's what the preachers are preaching in the world today. It's worthless lies. It's something that's comforting to people. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips. Listen to any preacher you want to on, the, on TV. And they use flattering lips and say, God wants you to be happy and have everything you want. He wants you to go through trials and persecution. That's what he wants for all of his believers. If you cannot be a believer and not have persecution, no such thing. We have to go through, to heaven through tribulation. The Bible says that we must through persecution enter God's kingdom. The Lord shall cut off, that means to kill, all flattering lips. And the tongue that speaketh proud things. You know why they're proud? They want to build a mega church. That's what the preachers want. You cannot build a mega church preaching what I preach. You cannot build a mega. Mega means huge or large. Say he's worth mega bucks. That means big dollars. You cannot preach what I preach and have a big church. You can't tell people you have to take your cross and die daily. You have to have a daily cross. You have to have self-denial. You cannot be famous and belong to God. Do I believe Dolly Parton belongs to God? No. The Bible says, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Does all the world speak well of Dolly Parton? Oh, yes, they do. All the world likes her because she giggles in X City and, and jokes about her breasts on Johnny Carton's show. She giggles and laughs about it. She's a ridiculous woman. You see, what goes on behind the scenes of those people? The Bible says, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Does all the world like Dolly Parton? Yeah. Does all the world like these superstars? Yeah. Don't think that because they're superstars that they're Christians. They're not. But when you... Dolly Parton thinks she, her grandfather was a Pentecostal preacher. That gives her a ticket to heaven. No, it doesn't. She's got to have a daily cross, death to self, self-denial. And the world has to hate her. Jesus said, if the world hated me, it'll hate you. Those are words that people don't want to hear that call themselves Christians. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Woe is the word O-U-A-I. It's a cry of damnation if the world likes you. Blessed are ye when men shall reproach you. You're blessed when you're reproached. O-N-E-I-D-I-Z-O. Oniedzo means to be infamous. You have to be infamous to be blessed by God. Not famous, exactly opposite of it. Infamous. Yet, do you think preachers are telling their congregations that? you got a lot of stars in Nashville that go to these Baptist churches. You think that the preacher's going to say, if you're famous, you're cursed by God? Do I believe it? Jesus said, does this sound like famous people? Jesus said in Luke 4.18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's the one that's doing the talking. For the Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Does that sound like famous? P-T-O-C-H-O-S. Tokas means emptied out. That's not famous people, is it? Emptied out. To the poor, to the blind. He's not talking about physically blind. He's talking about the Gentiles who had never had the truth for 4,000 years, and they were blind, and God is opening their eyes now. He said, to the brokenhearted. Now, this brokenhearted sounds like these rich stars. To the bruised. This is who Jesus came to. 
Bruise, throw, T-H-R-A-U. It means crushed. That's who Jesus came to, the crushed. If God is not crushing you with some health problems, some kind of problems, and you know how you're going to be crushed? Tell people the truth about the Bible. Let's go to another one of these flattery words. In Psalm 78, verse 36. He's talking about Israel, the story of God's wrath against the incredulous and disobedient Israelites. He says in verse 36, Nevertheless, they did flatter God with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues. They said, We love you, God. And they're worshiping Baal in the grove down the street. They had a God on every street. Let me give you another one of these. When you go to collect is this common word. Collect means to plot or be slippery, smooth of tongue. Proverbs 6 and 24. 6. Six and twenty-four. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore he will not spare in the day of revenge. He's saying here that God takes revenge on a man. And he's jealous when a man wants to be slippery with his tongue. He says here in verse 24. He says, keep thee, verse 24 of Proverbs 6. Well, let's read 22 and 20 to 24. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. He's talking about his word. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life to keep thee from the evil woman from the flattery of the tongue and the strange woman now he can be talking about Babylon but he can also be talking about a woman that wants to seduce and he says down here in verse 27 can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes be not burned what you run with if you run with the wrong woman, that'll get you in trouble. Look here in Proverbs 7, 5, and 21. 7 and 5. Well, let's read 4 and 5. Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger with flatter with her with her words, flattery will get you in trouble every time. I don't believe in flattery. If somebody wants to go up and say, Jim, I really love the message you preach, but don't fawn over me. Oh, you're so wonderful, you're so great, you're so, you just can't. I had one guy used to come here, and after every message, he'd say, that's the greatest message I ever heard in my life. And he went off, and he just left the truth, and he doesn't even believe any of it anymore. And here in verse 21, with her much fair speech, she caused him to yield, and with the flattering of her lips, she forced him. It's talking about getting involved in some woman that is not true to God. And then look here at Proverbs 7, 21. 7. Oh, sh Proverbs, excuse me. I'll get to it in a minute. Hold on a second. Proverbs 20 and verse 19. Proverbs 20 and 19. He that goeth about as a talebearer 
tail bearer is the word rakio, R-A-Y-R-A-K-I-Y-L. means to roll into pieces and to destroy by being a scandal monger. He that goeth about as a tail bearer reveal his secrets. Therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with the lips. He's a tail bearer. Flattereth. That word is pothal. P-A-T-H-A. P-A-T-H-A-H. It means to have an open mind like a child. To be simple-minded. You're simple-minded when you're not educated. Watch out what people say to you when you're young. You can't believe the older I get, the more skeptical I am of human nature. Most people are going to hell when they die. That's what the Bible says. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in their head because Straight is the gate that leads to eternal life, and few there be that find the straight gate. Only few, oligos, a puny number. Not many people in the world are going to heaven when they die. Do you ever hear a preacher say that to their congregation, that a lot of them may not be believers? Now, the people that are easily enticed, let me give you a couple more of these. Over here in Proverbs 26 and 28. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. When a man lies to you, he hates you. When a preacher lies to his congregation and covers up things that he shouldn't be telling them, he hates them. You know why preachers do that? It's not for their good. It's so they can build a bigger church. When a guy's running a thousand and a guy down the street's running three thousand, this preacher wants to pull all the tricks out of the bag so he can run three thousand. It's a contest. I don't know if you know that. It shouldn't be a contest. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. They'll ruin your life if they can. Let me give you a couple more of these. I love this right here. In Proverbs 28, 23, I love this verse. He that rebuketh a man afterwards, after it's over with, after you rebuke him, shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. The man that told them things they wanted to hear, the man that tells you the truth, after it's over with, he's going to find more favor from this man that you told the truth to. They're going to like you better. What's the use of beating around the bush? It's kind of like telling some guy, well, I don't want to say he's got cancer to him and he's dying of cancer. Don't you think it's better to tell him the truth about himself so that you could take your time to do something with his life and get his self straight. Whoso robbeth his father or his mother and saith, it is no transgression, the same as the companion of a destroyer. i got a couple more of these to read. Look here in in Ezekiel, the 12th chapter and the 24th verse. For there is no more any vain vision. What he's saying, God has carried Israel away into captivity and there's no more vain visions going on in Jerusalem from the prophets. Nor flattering divination Within the house of Israel, God has carried them all away. Divination means no more fairy tales or telling untruths. 
And look over here in Daniel, the 11th chapter. Daniel 11 is a form of kalal. This is when, when the Antiochus Epiphanes came into Israel and he wanted to take over he wanted to take over the system. He did it with flattery. He was flattering the people, telling them what they wanted to hear. Now, you know what all this has to do with? It has to do with marrying truth. How do you marry truth to a lie? The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, It'll be that way in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. It'll be that way in the days of the coming of Christ. Christ is coming back. I don't believe it's far away. I don't believe young people will get to be old before Christ gets here. Because we've got a messed up government. We've got all the politicians who are just all screwed up in their heads. The preachers are all lying, trying to build big churches. They're passing laws. The Bible says in the seventh chapter of Daniel that they're going to change times and laws at the end of time. And they're changing the times and the laws. It's not talking about men's laws. They're changing the laws of God. You can marry you can have lesbians marrying lesbians. You can abort babies. You can have homosexuals marrying homosexuals. That's getting to be the norm for the day. I believe we're headed down toward the end of all things. I don't see how it can be far. If I say this to people, when the Bible says a day is with the Lord is a thousand years, a day equals one thousand years. And when the Bible says in Acts 2, in Acts 2, where you're, you're talking about the birth of the church, birth of the New Testament church, birth of the New Testament church, this has to do with what I was saying earlier about Satan being bound for a 2,000 year period. The word bound, Satan is bound, Dio, forbidden. From deceiving the nations. Nation is the word ethnos. For a 2,000 year period. Where's the 2,000 years? From Acts 2, I believe, to the end of time. I don't know if this is exactly right. This is the way I look at it. From Acts 2, that was around 33 to 35 A.D. From Acts 2 until the end of time, I believe, will be a 2,000-year period. That would make 35 A.D. just about the end of all things. If a day is with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. We're sitting on the verge of eternity. It's just our government's corrupt. All of the politicians are corrupt to the core. I'm not a Republican and I'm not a Democrat. I don't believe in any of them. They bring out, I keep saying this, they bring out a king cobra and a black mamba and they ask you which one you want to sleep with and both of them will kill you when they, one's a Republican, the other's a Democrat. I haven't voted since Ronald Reagan. If I had to do over it again, I wouldn't vote for him. I don't believe in any of them. When a man gets to the top of politics, he gets corrupt because the amount of the amount of temptation is phenomenal. When Obama went into office, I read that he was worth about four hundred thousand dollars. 
when he came out of office, he's worth about 12 to $13 million. They all go in. They're not worth much. They come out and they're wealthy. But not just him. The Bushes, make, they make the Kennedys look like paupers. They have hundreds of millions of dollars. They were, that, they were oil well people down in Texas before they got into politics. I don't believe in any of them. None of them. I believe that we're close to the end of all things. I'm not saying it's going to be 35 A.D. There was 4,000 years or four days from what the Bible calls a thousand years from Adam until Acts 2 when God pours out of his spirit on all flesh red, yellow, white, black and brown flesh and then the Bible says this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel that in the last days the Lord will pour out of his spirit on all flesh or the Gentiles. This is where a certain number of Gentiles cannot be fooled as of Acts 2. That's, that's nearly 2,000 years ago. So you got four days, 4,000 years, and the number of man's days, work days, is six. Four and 2,000 is 6,000 years. That's the way the Bible adds it up. 35 A.D. could be the very end of everything. I probably won't live till then. Some of y'all will. I believe we're headed to the end of time. With the condition, this is not the world that I was raised in in the 1940s. It's not the world of the 1950s. Everything has gotten so corrupt. It's just gotten backwards. Now, I want to continue in this, this teaching on what the Bible says. I want to show you something. I want you to turn over to, I've been talking about truth marrying a lie. Turn over here to 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. 2 Corinthians 6. I'm still talking about truth marrying a lie. When the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. That's the whole key. Giving in marriage is the key to the end of all this. Giving marriage is a word. Ek. Giving marriage. Ek gamedzo. E K. G. A M I Z O. It comes from Gamizo or Gamisco, G A M I S K O. Gamisco means to espouse a daughter. Outside, ek means out. There's a sign over there where that door says exit. It means out of the family. To marry a daughter outside of a family meant to take in the lies. That's what they did in the days of Noah. The sons of God married the daughters of men. Sons of God... married daughters of men. Now there's this old fairy tale that says sons of God were giants. No, 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 no. 
when the, they married the daughters of men and they produced giants in those days. But the word is not giant. It's the word Nephilim, N-E-P-H-I-Y-L-I-M. I-Y-M. I am is always plural. Nephilim, nephil, means a bully. A tyrant. If you want to get a tyrant, just tell one of these preachers. Tell a Pentecostal preacher there is no such thing as tongue. Tell him that it's the word glossa and dialectos in the original Greek text. And then tell him that you can show him these words in a strong, exhaustive concordance and it doesn't say what they're doing in the Pentecostal churches. This is a concordance. Everybody needs to have one. You can look up these words in a strong, exhaustive concordance. Every word is listed alphabetically in the Bible. There's a number to the side of it. And if you look up that number to the side of it, it'll tell you in the if it's a New Testament word, you look up that number in the Greek dictionary in the back. If it's a Old Testament word, you look it up in the Hebrew dictionary in the back. It makes it simple and easy. But try to tell some Pentecostal there's no such thing as Pentecostal tongues that it's gloss and dialectos and they become bullies. Tell a Baptist preacher there's no such thing as a sinner's prayer for salvation. Boy, they all believe that. They, every Baptist church in America believes. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's true. But if you read the next verse, you can't call on a God you don't believe in. The Bible says that how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? I don't believe in Zeus. I don't believe in Jupiter. I'm not going to pray to Zeus any moment. I'm not going to pray to Jupiter. I don't believe they're there. And a man who's dead in his sin, how is he going to pray to a God he don't believe in? He has to believe, but where does the belief come from? God has to pick a family out before the world begins. He has to arrange their lives across the preaching of the truth. And somehow that God has to put it into their heart. And then they start saying, I believe. Well, where would you get the belief? I don't know where I got it. If you believe God, where did you get it? Did you conjure it up in yourself? You didn't. The Bible says it has to come from God because you were dead. I love the verse in Isaiah 64 and 7. I love this verse because it assures me that it's very assuring that the sinner's prayer is not true. The sinner's prayer for salvation is not true. Every Baptist church in America preaches that. Every one I ever heard of. And the Bible says, there's none that calleth on thy name. Nobody. Calls. Upon the name of God. And then it says. That stirreth up himself. Stirreth up. Stirreth up is one word in the Hebrew. It's the word U-W-R. It says nobody, when they're dead, wakes themselves from the dead by calling on God. Wakes self from dead. To take hold of thee. Nobody calls upon the name of the Lord when they're dead to wake himself from the dead, to take hold of God. That lays it out as simple as it can be. There is no sinner's prayer for salvation. What about all these people that pray 
and then they get up and they go live the way they want to. They didn't pray a sinner's prayer. They just repeated some mantra that was given to them by some Baptist preacher. It's not true. If you really call upon God, your heart has to be broken. Oh, God, save me for Jesus' sake and let me be a different man. But you have to be believing God before you can do that. Don't you? What they're doing, they're mixing truth to a lie. How much time to have, Mike? I want you to just look at it. This is an example of how you can't mix truth to a lie. Go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 12. No, 2 Corinthians 6, excuse me. 2 Corinthians 6, I get these things mixed up in my head. 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. Starting here in verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. If you're a preacher, don't preach smooth words, flattering words to yoke with an unbelieving man in your congregation because he's one of the deacons and he tithes and puts his money in your church. I believe that's why a lot of preachers preach these smooth words is get to is get more wolves in their church to make the building payment. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? How can you have kononia? K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. How can you be a partaker with a man who doesn't know anything about the truth? We should never be fellowshipping with people. You mean, does that mean in every part of our life? Do you know that I don't run around with anybody except someone that is a part of this ministry. I have Dave and Mike over to watch football or watch the fights, but I don't have anybody else and and, uh, Zach and anybody else that wants to come. That's one of the males. You want to watch the fights with us, watch the football game. But I don't have anybody that's not a believer. What are we going to do, get them over there and say, Christmas is pagan and God doesn't love everybody. They go, I don't like that. And they're going to start a fight. I preach to people out in public. I don't beat them up. I just tell them the truth. And then he says, For what fellowship does light Christ have with darkness? And what communion does Christ have with Belial? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Concord is the word symphoneo. S-U-M. P-H-O-N-E-O. It comes from phone, which is the word voice. And soon means together. It actually is our word symphony. What's symphony? If you have if you're going to have if you're going to have harmony, you gotta have a one, five, and a three chord. You can't have harmony otherwise. You know, you could have a seventh or a ninth uh chord on a, but most people don't understand seventh, ninth chords go through the head or a sixth. You've got to have the right structure to have symphony. And then he says, What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what hath part that he believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God, which temple ye are, with idols? Those people that serve what they see. For ye are the temple of the living God, 
As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among these lying preachers and people, and be separate, and touch not the unclean thing, and then I'll receive you. He won't receive you in fellowship if you run with the wrong people. We're not supposed to be doing that. If anyone comes preaching any other doctrine, this is in Second John six or Second John ten. If anyone comes preaching any other doctrine, Second John ten, do not bid them God speed. If they preach any other doctrine, and he's talking about agape all through that chapter. Agape is walking after the commandments of God. Walk in commandments. Because in verse 6 of that chapter, this is agape that we walk after his commandments. If anyone comes preaching any of the doctrine besides walking in the commandments of God, do not bid them God's speed. God's speed does not mean to go fast like God goes. <laughs> It's not God's speed. God's speed is the word caro. It comes from the word charis, which is the word grace. Don't be gracious to them. Are you saying don't be polite to people in public? I'm polite to everybody. But I don't take them into my fellowship. I don't just bring them, say, would you like to come to my house and eat on Friday night? And I know you believe in Christmas and I know you believe in free will and you don't believe in predestination. I want to come bring you over and try to convince you to convert. No. We don't have anything to do with them. I'm gentle to everybody. I talk to people everywhere I go. I talk to people at the grocery store. I talk to my doctors. I talk to my doctors in a civilized manner, in a gentle, quiet way, but I don't cut any slack for them. They know medicine, but they don't know nothing about the Bible. Nothing. I told my doctor, my heart doctor, I said, my cardiologist, he had a Bible on his desk. I said, why you got this Bible on your desk? You don't believe nothing that's in it. Why don't you leave the Bible up to me and you stick with medicine, Okay. He just laughs when I say that kind of stuff to him because he doesn't have anybody that's got the guts to say that to him. I will say anything. I'll tell you what, speaking the truth will do you. It'll make you free. If you can get about four or five people angry at you, one more or less won't matter. Get about, get about five people angry at you for telling them about Christmas. One more ain't going to matter. Get about five people angry at you for telling them about predestination. One more won't matter. Get about five people angry at you for saying God loved Jacob and hated Esau before they were born. He didn't love everybody. One more won't matter. If you can get enough people angry at you for telling the truth, you know what that does? It makes you free. You know why you're free? Is because everybody gets to knowing who you are and they say, shh, here comes Jim, shh, be quiet. Don't say nothing because he'll, he'll say some truth and we may not like it. I opened my mouth at everybody. There was a Mormon that came across the street over at Ben's house and I went over and one day and I just started talking about the Bible and God and I told him I said I don't believe in the Baptist church and I was raised in the Baptist church and I don't believe in the Mormon church either I told him that I don't believe in any of the churches I don't believe any of them are telling the truth and he just went <laughs> he just looked at me funny because I told him I didn't believe in his church either but first thing I did I implicated myself. I said, I don't even believe in my church that I was raised in. Now I don't believe in yours either. Because he, what are you going to say to me? Well, why don't you believe your own church? Because I don't believe the preachers today know anything about the truth. They're flattering the world. It's what they're doing. Am I out of time, Mike? Two minutes. 
I've got so much more to say on this. I'm just, I want to tell you how God was cruel, cruel to, to, Joseph, to, to Job. I want to tell you how God is cruel in our lives. How that God is a terrible God. The Bible says he is a great and mighty and a terrible God. And Job said he was cruel to me. He took me up by my neck and shook me to pieces when he killed all of my seven sons and three daughters and took all of my substance, all of my cattle, all of my asses, all of my sheep. He said he shook me to pieces. That's what Job said. You know what? God needs to be cruel to us and shake us to pieces to cause us to realize we have to suffer for tribulation's sake. The preachers are not preaching this. They're lying. They're not telling you you've got to suffer to be a Christian. I love the verse. I'll quote it one more time. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Scarcity is the word mogus. It means with great difficulty. Have you ever heard a preacher say you have to be saved through difficulty? I never heard one. You have to suffer. Read. I'll tell you what you do. Read your Bible and see how the believers suffered there. Read the book of Acts, the actions of the apostles. See how they were they suffered persecution. Most of the apostles died the martyr's death. Do you want to die the martyr's death? I'll stop here. I'll come back and tell you some more about these preachers that are lying as fast as they talk. If you go to a church and the preachers bore you, you should be bored. Because they're boring. Boring. <laughs> they bore me. They don't give any definition, any culture, any customs, any idioms, any metaphors. They don't tell you what something meant in the first century. They don't care. They just want to build a mega church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. I pray that you'll crush us under your hand and cause us to be hated by the world for saying these truths. I pray that you'll help us to stand for the truth. Help the people to understand that it'll make them free. It'll make you free once you start telling the truth and you know everybody is going to be down on you for saying it and say, well, that's too bad. That's what the truth is. We pray that you'll give us strength to stand, fight our battles. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, I hope you know the preachers are not telling the truth. They're lying. sobering especially when it applies to us we know it applies to us huh well it does all that smooth talk is worthless I hope y'all get a hold of that Sorry, it's not a wooden cross. Oh, yeah. And they had a cow's trough. So they could baptize. Had a what? Had a cow, a cow's trough, in other words, where they could baptize people. Oh, good grief. Yeah, that's what I said. Good grief. Oh, obviously.
I got fired up. Oh, yeah, that's... Hey, Daniel. How you doing? What you doing, Daniel? Hey, you getting long. Doing okay. Huh? Doing all right? Well, this is a hard message. I know that, but it's, it's supposed to be. I can't even watch those preachers and wait and listen to what they're saying and right now the mushiness they're saying. I can't stand it. I mean, I'll watch for five minutes and I'm, God, that's enough of this. Nothing. Nothing. Just zero. Zip. Just, I don't think I'm going to say it. I mean, they say the most cliche words. Just cliche. Jesus loves you and he wants to come back and take you. That's his command. Bye. Is that for your company? We got to win that for do some work. Yeah, well, they're, they're wanting us to come, come in Tuesdays and Wednesdays now from now on. So I'm, I'm already looking you for. You were transferred here by your company, wouldn't you? No, they, we don't have a we don't have a sales. We don't have a location. Well, I'm looking for. I have an interview with, with T-Mobile. Oh, for, with T-Mobile? What are they doing up here? Smooth talk. Right. He said, Oh, and you know what? He changed his income after the conversation. So I was talking to him like him. Yeah. But I said, Don't talk to me like that. Nobody ever says that. Nobody ever says, Don't talk to me that way. Nobody, nobody's got the guts to do that. Mm -hmm. You're going to come out and see yeah. some of the fighting. Oh, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. We had a good fight. A couple of weeks ago, I, I, a couple weeks I didn't ago. even realize it was going to happen. And Mike said, "You're going to watch that fight tonight." I said, "I forgot about that." Did you watch the? They don't have as many good fights as they used to have. The last one was what? But Crawford and uh, Spence Jr. Did you watch that? The box, that was boxing, though. Yeah, was I don't. Going. I don't get involved with the boxing and okay. and, and the U.S. Come back and bring Brother with you. <laughs> okay, we'll come watch the fight. Okay, come watch it. I'll tell you when we're done.